Okay. Hello, everyone. Hi. Ciao, Stefano. Hi. Hi, Alex. Ciao. How are you doing? Very well. So sound looks nice at my side. Picture looks nice at my side. And I'm feeling great because I'm here with you and with all our guests. Let me see how it goes on YouTube. Yeah, so maybe we can ask our friends there. If you can hear both of us clearly, then please give us a thumbs up so we know yeah. we can go. If picture is good, if sound is good, yeah. set the thumbs up and let's start. Yes. yes. Hi, Perfect. Sailor. Thank, Thank you, you, Sailor. Thank you, Sarjit. Thank you, Sarjit. Thank you, everyone. So yeah. let's go. We are going go. to cover a lot today, so we cannot wait to start. Let's go then. Uh, so welcome everyone. That's uh, introduction to NoSQL databases with Apache Cassandra, uh, Aka Cassandra Fundamentals. Uh, with you today, uh, Stefano Latini, developer advocate at DataStax and my partner in crime, mm -hmm. and uh, Alex Volishnev, also developer advocate at DataStax. We uh, work a lot with uh, different databases, with different applications, using different languages. E, what is your favorite programming language? Not what you are using currently, but what would you like to use if it would be for you to decide? Please write on the YouTube chat. It's always very interesting for us. Yeah. And, yeah, and you know what? Yeah. Sorry, something very interesting is the difference between the two things you said. I remember some statistics on the number of commits to GitHub uh, during weekdays and the weekend, and it was a totally different distribution. Because weekends are, as, are where you use your favorite language, and weekdays are where you use the language you have to use. And it was interesting that there is quite a gap between the two. Yeah, yeah, our difference indeed is pretty high. Uh, meanwhile, we will move on. Uh, this workshop consists of two parts. Uh, first part is theoretical where we explain the fundamentals. And second part is hands-on practical, because we believe in hands-on education. You have to touch everything. You have to execute commands. You have to make it running. And then only when you really understand how it works. Uh, so for the hands-on part, everything is published on the GitHub. We are extremely open source friendly, and we try to publish everything we can publish. Uh, so this workshop is published uh, materials uh, has published materials as well. As an IDE, we will use Cloud IDE in a browser, Gitbot. You can use it for free, and it's a great project. We use it on all of our educational uh, projects. If you, uh, if any of you guys work uh, from, if you are from Gitbot, then hello, thank you for the amazing product. Uh, then uh, to avoid uh, this, this deploying and managing clusters, uh, what may be pretty challenging sometimes, we will use Apache Cassandra as a service. Uh, AstroDB is, we can say, Cassandra as a service in the cloud. Uh, we have a very good free tier, so you are very well welcomed here today. You don't have to install anything, and still you will have to push for buttons right in your browser executing commands. Stefano. You wanted to say something? Um, I was actually configuring Nightbot, and uh, ah, okay. that's maybe a good uh, a good thing to remind our friends there. Uh, we have a bot that will help you with a few uh, answers in the chat, so it will drop links for us and help us along the way. So watch out for this Nightbot friend. It, it just told you that there is a GitHub repository indeed, and you can go there and, well, we will go th there together anyway. So yeah, let's start. Cool. Next thing, uh, if you want to brag of your new knowledge, well deserve it, uh, rather right to brag on LinkedIn or Facebook or whatever you prefer, then you can submit your homework, submit your practical part, um, and answer a couple of questions, and you can get this shiny page to brag on LinkedIn. Good. Uh, instructions are coming in the end of the workshop. And uh, meanwhile, we want to know you a bit better. Uh, so uh, to get better understanding, and you will have to answer my questions during the workshop. And to answer those questions, uh, you should join Menti. Thank you, Stefano. Yeah, link is right in the chat, or you can oh, use yeah. your mobile phone. Also work. 
and uh, you will answer my questions on Menti. You can just scan the QR code right here. I will give you a few more seconds. Yeah, uh, uh, the or, same is yeah. the link in the chat. We'll make you join as well. Mm -hmm. And let's start meanwhile. Menti instructions uh, are always on top of the screen when Menti is shown. So just go to menti.com and use the code 44887831 or follow the link uh, of the nightbot in the chat. And uh, let's go. So relational database experience, at least everyone have some, which is great. I see, I believe some students may be here, which is also great because, well, those who want to know more usually get better paid, <laughs> uh, which is fine. Uh, there is someone with zero relational database experience. This workshop may be a little bit advanced for people with no prior database experience, but still uh, try to keep up. And if you don't, then just save this link. Uh, video will be available afterwards, so you can jump in later and again get all the power. When this workshop is over, only then you decide what it's over. Final question, your experience with uh, non-relational databases. Okay, a little plenty. Cool. Many people with no SQL experience. That's amazing. Usually we don't have a picture like that. Like we run a lot of trainings and most of the cases, like most of the developers, no, I don't have no SQL experience. That is good. Uh, yeah, well, it will be easier for you. Oh, uh, well, so let's go and nice. Uh, ah, last question. Okay, I will start with the slides, and meanwhile, you can answer this question. What is the database you use the most? We will get the results uh, soon. And now let's uh, proceed with the slides. First question I want to answer is why Cassandra? But not why you should use Cassandra. Maybe you shouldn't. I don't know your situation. Different databases for different projects. But why Cassandra was created, understanding of this concept really helps you to get into this software architect uh, mindset, because understanding of why it was created answers the question which problems it solves. And then you know if it fits your problem or doesn't. So I believe every developer wants to become software architect at some point. So let's speak architectural a little bit. We today are going to answer a question, how it works internally. Well, yes, how to use it, of course, too. You need to know how to use it. But for me, the most important question is how it works internally. You can teach monkey to push the red button if a uh, red light blinks. That's not a big deal. But I want you to be engineers, problem solvers, architects, not just uh, people pushing buttons without understanding how it works under the hood. So we are going to make a dive under the hood today. Uh, very important disclaimer. Uh, there are some problems I see in development teams I always try to address. So when I say don't try this at home, I'm of course kidding. Please try this at home. But if you're going uh, to deploy, uh, to include Cassandra in your stack and your production on your project, like make it for your customers, then you need to really know a few things beforehand. First thing, have anyone ever heard about farm-driven development? <laughs> Please answer on the YouTube chat. I really cannot wait for your answer. Uh, if you have heard about that or if you haven't, write on the YouTube chat. Or if you can guess what that means. <laughs> or if you can guess what that means. So uh, farm-driven development is the uh, development where architectural decisions are made based on what uh, fun companies are uh, using. Like we are going to use technology, this technology in our project because Facebook uses it, or Apple or Amazon uses it, or Netflix uses it, or Google uses it. So that's why we will use this technology. It's called fund-driven development. And that is often a very big problem for um, projects. Don't do that. That is a bad, uh, you have your own problems. Facebook has their own problems. So you, ne you need to think architectural to make good architectural decisions. Uh, 
in the chat, development Greg is, sorry in the chat greg hi greg is smiling about <laughs> <laughs> fung driven development yes yes hi greg so please don't do fung driven development is not pro is an unprofessional think and pick technologies what fit your problems and your problems you are solving next thing have you ever heard of cv driven development cv driven development is even worse cv driven development and then the when is the technology for a project is picked because developer wants to add it into his or her cv uh, i consider it as very close to a crime or at least like fraud over your uh, employer uh, you have to pick uh, make decisions based on the problems your project has so don't do cv driven development and final thing great power comes with great responsibility today you will learn about the more one of the most or maybe the most powerful database uh, currently existing and uh, you will see soon some stats uh, you like will be interested by some numbers great power comes with great responsibility this means in this context you need to learn how to land your airplane before taking off if you just start to use it as it advanced distributed technology you may run and will run mostly probably on production what will hurt your project what will hurt your customers and that's not what we need so if you want to fly an airplane you first learn how to land and then you take off Luckily for you, Datastack sponsors education and certification for Apache Cassandra, so you don't have to pay for that at all, and you still can get trained and certified. More information is coming in the end of a workshop. So, it all started in the year 2008. Uh, in the year 2008, Facebook reached their first 100 million users. I believe there were the first company to reach that magical number. Now there are plenty of companies who have similar numbers, but uh, they were, I believe, the very first one. And that is huge. But actually, situation, the problem we were solving wasn't actually just a huge amount of users. It was worse. First of all, like a little bit of situation uh, analysis, they had users all around the world. Uh, on all the continents. Before that, most of the businesses were strictly regional. Whatever e-commerce, whatever uh, applic web application, but still it was operating. Most of them were operating at least on a single continent. Now situation started to change. Then fast internet connection. I don't know if many of you remember the sounds of uh, modem or whatever USA Robotics uh, 56K. Uh, I still remember, and uh, this uh, fast internet connection, it actually changed it a lot. Now we take it as a given, but in the year 2008, more and more people getting fast internet connection. Why it is so important? The story is before internet connection was a bottleneck. Doesn't matter how fast your database. Hi, Jose, uh, Jose, Jose sorry. Um, <laughs> there are some people who remember the modem. Okay, good. Yeah, me too. <laughs> no doubt. So, before, doesn't matter how fast your database is, still ESP, uh, Internet Service Provider Connection, will be the bottleneck. But it wasn't the story anymore that totally changed requirements for the database. Development of the networks, yes. Then, much more data than ever before, and more and more each year. And then, finally, high availability requirements. So, uh, fast answer fast answer everywhere considering speed of light it's a problem and then uh, availability requirements for the application to be available all that time and uh, <laughs> in the year 2008 we tried to find a, a proper solution for that and we were known so uh, engineers from facebook started to work on something would later become apache cassandra now, as we think as architects today, we are going first to define the requirements. If we don't define requirements, uh, then we don't know what exactly we are going to do. And our requirements will be basically those four um, groups, let's say, to focus, uh, four focuses. First, geo. 
geographically distributed customers all around the world, or at least in multiple regions very often, then we are going to have volume and velocity. Volume, maybe petabytes of data, maybe more. And uh, amount of operations, millions of queries per second, up to millions of queries per second, up to dozens millions of queries per second. Now we have high SLA service level agreement, so requirement, definite requirements for our project. Response has to be as quick as possible, preferably within single digit millisecond. So very strict SLA for response time. And then finally, uh, very high requirements for service level agreements on the availability. So we can go to nine nines. If you don't know these uh, nines thing, it's like percentage um, of the time what your project must be available. And we measure that in nines after comma or after punct, uh, point uh, in 99.999999. Um, so how 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 long your database must be available for the customers? What are the allowed interruptions? So we want to go to incredibly strict requirements. And based on these um, um, requirements, we go to design decisions. Uh, and uh, our decisions based on those requirements will be very um matching what we want to have as a result first we will need multiple data centers multiple data centers so single cluster multiple servers working together but they will be geographically distributed and launch it in multiple different regions that answers two questions at first first we keep our data close to our customers and that helps us to always give a fast answer if your australian customers should not work with a database here close to Frankfurt, right? It's not going to be fast. Speed of light, we cannot beat yet. Yes. Uh, and meanwhile, that is answer also for a high availability requirement. Then second thing, to be able to handle data and proud put of any size, we have to split our data into partitions. We split uh, our data into chunks, what solves the problem of scaling and handling of a data of any size. Meanwhile, it brings some problems. I don't want to lie to you. There is a lot of fun working with uh, distributed technologies. Oh. Uh, yeah, but uh, again, as long as it gets paid well, I'm fine with that. Then to answer requirements for time, we will need denormalization because denormalization is one of the most uh, important improvisations improvements you want to implement to get your answers very quickly. And we will need partition-based routing, so we will not search for uh, partition and data across multiple servers, but we will hit server what stores our data directly without any additional search operations. Otherwise, it will be slow. And then finally, for high availability, we need to have replication, so our data is copied multiple times and stored it on different servers, so single server outage doesn't lead to a problem with the data. And then decentralization, to be explained soon. Um, now, for the dozens of years, relational databases were dominating uh, market of uh, databases, database management systems, to be more exact. And that is for uh, very important reasons. First of all, they are good. There are some people saying what NoSQL will replace uh, SQL. That is bullshit. That's not going to happen. Relational databases are great. Um, and um, they are actually uh, very versatile, and their power is what their true multipurpose. So they can play on OLTP field, kind of, and they can play on OLAP field, kinda. Also, there are better solutions for both OLTP and OLAP. What is that I'm talking about? Like, I believe most of you didn't map these definitions before. OLTP stands for Online Transaction Processing. Uh, and those kind of workloads are usually um, mean a lot of operations per second and very strict requirements. That's all about customer facing data. And your customers don't love to wait. You as a customer don't love to wait. If uh, you wait for so long and your business business is not answering, then you will just switch to competitors, right? That's what your uh, clients will do. 
So OLTP is customer facing. A lot of operations and they have to be executed very fast. Uh, meanwhile, on our side of the field is OLAP workload. OLAP workload stands for Online Analytical Processing. Analytical processing means uh, we work with data, we explore data, a lot of data. Uh, we do very advanced complex queries with thousands of joints. And uh, we do uh, also, we work with historical data. The ILTP usually works with live data, more or less fresh. Um, principal difference of uh, OLAP to OLTP, it, uh, OLAP usually means what uh, those who do analytical processing can wait because they are your colleagues. They are um, basically people who uh, get paid for what they're doing, not paying to you. Uh, and if a complex query with dozens of joints find all customers who have bought uh, car tires last year and <laughs> did not bought, uh, I don't know, whatever uh, watches uh, previous year, but then they bought uh, car tires, it was raining, uh, and their <laughs> age is more than uh, 39 years, things like that, like a lot, a lot of joints going to be in this uh, query. And this query cannot be quick. It doesn't uh, have to be. So yeah, it doesn't, and it doesn't have to be. So that is the principal okay. difference of OLAP to OLTP. So as humanity went uh, walk evolved over time from uh, the times where everyone was a warrior, a gatherer, a farmer, a hunter. Everyone was doing the same job, basically. Then we evolved to specializations. And now there are developers, uh, there are, I don't know, car engineers. Uh, there are many different specializations. Why? Because it's efficient. Exactly the same thing is happening on the database world. So uh, we went away from generalization to specialization. And uh, Apache Cassandra is distributed, decentralized, OLTP-first database. Um, why distributed? Because it's designed from the very beginning to run on multiple servers simultaneously. You can tell me what my uh, MySQL does the same, and uh, yes and no. Uh, there is a great word in German language, Jein. Uh, it means ja und nein. So technically, yes, you can launch MySQL on the multiple machines or Postgres or Oracle, but they always going to have one single uh, primary server or master, like we use it to say, and multiple follower servers, read-only replicas. Cassandra is decentralized, what means what each node has the same duties. It may store different data, but each node basically is a master node. True democracy, everyone decides. It's a very advanced technology, you will like it. Then OLTP means it's ready for high volume, high throughput, millions of operations over of petabytes of data on a distributed data. And that is an advanced thing, guys. Now, um, it was in the past. Now we are in the year 2022. What's going on now on Apache, with Apache Cassandra? Is anyone using it at all? A short answer is yes. Even you using Cassandra, even if you don't know it, but you use Uber, you use Cassandra. You uh, use any Apple device, you use Cassandra. You watch Netflix, uh, you uh, use Cassandra. You play, I don't know, World of Warcraft, you use Cassandra. And uh, so on and so forth. Basically, most of the global companies are uh, using Cassandra at the moment. Apple at our uh, at ApacheCon 2022, Apple reported what their deployment of Cassandra includes uh, more than 300,000 of Cassandra servers. So it's like uh, one of the hugest deployments we ever have heard. And I believe Huawei's deployment is like uh, also pretty big. Uh, they store hundreds of petabytes of data and serve millions of queries per second. Sadly, Apple doesn't open too many details about that, so we don't know a lot. It's top secret. Uh, what, uh, guys, I really like is Netflix. Netflix is very friendly, and they uh, tell us a lot about how they use Cassandra. They have incredible tech block. You totally have to subscribe. And they speak what technologies they use, how they use, what they develop. They're very open source friendly. Uh, so, for example, those... Um, 
not only Cassandra users, but also developers, because they contribute a lot to Cassandra. They participate in Cassandra development. Instagram, Netflix, Apple, all those companies work to improve Cassandra, and that is great. Um, so, and the Netflix reported what, what on their single most active cluster in the last year, they were processing up to 30 million operations per second. That is a tremendous workload. They have multiple clusters, but this one is the most loaded. If you count it all together, it will be much more actually. So I was talking and talking. Now your time to answer my question. So keep an eye on your Mentimeter. Yep. Uh, now, meanwhile, uh, we get the results of oh, nice. uh, database you use the most. Oh, there are some people using Cassandra. That's great. Um, yeah. Good. But we see what MySQL and Mongo are leading, and that is totally makes sense. Excellent. I see Cosmos DB. Okay, I don't see this name often. SQL Server, uh, Excel, lol. <laughs> that was good. Okay. Uh, so let's move to the next. Uh, let's let's move to the next question now. I will start. Uh, so, first question I'm going to ask. Uh, Cassandra is best fit for uh, OLAP workloads, OLTP workloads, both type of workloads. Uh, there is a little bit um, complicated question. Uh, I'm also using Cassandra, but not sure how to backup and restore if needed. Umesh, best tool to backup and restore is Medusa. Medusa developed by Spotify originally, and now maintained by the last pickle um, company, which was acquired by Datastax recently. So right answer, Cassandra is best fit for OLTP workloads. Although there are some kinds of OLAP workloads what can be executed over Cassandra if you just want to watch time series data, changes mm -hmm. like temperature in this forest over time for the last year. Yes, this kind of um, research can be done. But as it's no relational database, there are no joins and any kind of the complicated queries with multiple joins, uh, querying data from different tables, it's not going to be easy. So Cassandra is, first of all, OLTP specific. Very well. So let's switch back and let's go. Yes, uh, search capabilities indeed are very limited. Uh, so what are the primary features people pick Cassandra um, to use in their projects? First of all, it's partitioning, because partitioning makes database capable to handle data of any size, literally any size. So we speak about petabytes and petabytes and hundreds of petabytes of data. Then, obviously, read-write performance. As Cassandra is OLTP-specific, first of all, it is very performant. It is extremely quick. Um, killer feature, really killer feature, is scalability. Uh, you may, uh, like, there are some people who say, like, yeah, but, but my Postgres scales. Yes, what is the most uh, loaded uh, Postgres deployment you've ever seen. We will speak mostly probably about dozens, thousands of queries per second. With Cassandra, maybe there are some more advanced deployments. Um, but uh, anyway, we will not speak about millions of queries per second. With Cassandra, we can speak about dozens of millions. But most of all, a real killer feature is linear scalability. What that means, as Cassandra scales horizontally, so you add more servers, to get more uh, volume or to handle higher uh, workload, then you just have to add more servers. Uh, some years ago, Netflix did a very interesting research scaling their uh, database from uh, around 50 servers, uh, test deployment, but real expensive servers, up to almost 300. So they were adding more and more servers to Apache Cassandra cluster, meanwhile measuring the volume uh, amount of operations per second. Client writes by node count. And look how nice and straight this line. Most of the databases have overhead on adding new servers. When you add, uh, when you add a server, it will not really, at some point, it will not help your cluster anymore. And this line is straight. It has this uh, linearity. 
This is totally great feature, what is very important for many projects. Now, um, do you see this mark over here? That uh, you know that, right, when you sign a contract or when you get a credit or anything, if there is a, uh, this mark in the contract and like small text downwards, you need to read it really thoroughly because there may be some uh, hidden uh, underwater stones and dangers. Uh, yes, there is. Uh, Cassandra scalability is a shared responsibility. Cassandra is a great tool, but you need to do your data model right. If you don't do your data model right, it will not scale. And then you may run into troubles. It will not scale like that if you didn't do your part of the job. Luckily for you, Datastax has you cover it. So we have free course, like real course, around uh, 15 hours, I believe, uh, on how do you do proper data modeling uh, with Apache Cassandra to make your application efficient and fast. You need to learn some things. But again, Cassandra developers getting better paid. So totally worth to me. Um, Indeed. So highest, yep. Yeah. Indeed. Mm -hmm. yeah. Highest availability, we discussed already. First, your data is replicated. Second, your data is replicated into different regions. Third, there is no single point of failure because of a decentralized nature we discussed soon. Uh, network topology where data placement, so replicas will be put on different servers, on different server racks, on different availability zones if you deploy in cloud. So that is a very cool technology for if you cannot reach desired availability level of Apache Cassandra, when there is no database in the world, you can reach it basically. Then uh, client side uh, reconnection, balancing, and strong retry mechanisms. Cassandra drivers, by the way, originally developed uh, by uh, Datastax. Most of them now contributed to Apache Software Foundation. Are also very smart and reliable. Now, operations on a huge cluster can be really exhaustive. Like, I know I can tell you a lot about that. So, Cassandra is very smart, and Cassandra cluster can execute many operations you use it to do manually with our databases. Cassandra cluster can execute them automatically for scaling, for partitioning, for moving data, starting new nodes, and many, many other operations. We don't focus on that today because this course is mostly for developers. Then Cassandra trademark is distributed to global deployments, but what really matters is all data centers are active. There are plenty of databases what can have multiple data centers in their clusters. But in most of the cases, it will be active passive. So in one data center, you can write data and read data, and in other databases, in other data centers, you can read only and you cannot write. With Cassandra, all data centers are active and you can write to them. Cassandra is a uh, Apache Software Foundation project. It's not bound to any platform. You can run it everywhere on any cloud, moreover, on multiple clouds simultaneously. Then, Cassandra, finally, my favorite part, Cassandra does not belong to any commercial vendors. Like Datastax wrote a lot, a big part of uh, Cassandra, but it, it's controlled by Apache Software Foundation, which is a non-profit, open source, foundation, you already know, like if you ever have heard or used Hadoop, Spark, Kafka, Zookeeper, Maven, Airflow, many other projects, they all control it by Apache Software Foundation. So there are some uh, catches you need to know. It's distributed, non-relational, OLTP database. It's extremely powerful, but it comes with some costs. First, there are no joins which means a lot of denormalization. Second, uh, running your queries, you must know the partition key. Otherwise, you will have to ask all the servers of your cluster. I will explain it soon, but now just keep it in mind. There is price to pay. Very limited search capabilities. In most of the cases, uh, you may want to use Cassandra with additional tools like Elasticsearch, for example, uh, or maybe Apache Spark if you need to run some analytics over your data. They make perfect teamwork, and there are plenty of integrations partially developed by Datastax or by other companies. And last thing, uh, it requires qualified personnel both from development and operations. In this case, we, uh, as Datastax, help with that because first we sponsor education and training and certification for you developers, what makes you make more money. 
And then uh, for uh, we also have a commercial project like uh, AstroDB we will use today, which is um, like removes this operational headache from companies and our engineers will take care of operations. Question. Uh, now you answer my question and we will see how good I was in my job. How do you scale a Cassandra cluster? Scale up by upgrading servers, scaling out by adding servers. Uh, Cassandra cluster does not need scaling. Okay, time is almost over. And the answers are coming in. Time is up, right. Uh, yes, Cassandra scales horizontally by adding more servers. And there are two people answer it. Cassandra cluster doesn't need scaling. First of all, thank you. We really appreciate. <laughs> but, uh, well, we wish. Mm, that would be great. But no, sometimes you need to scale Cassandra, Cassandra cluster. Good news, it's easy. Yeah. Uh, and let's get back. Then, uh, Introduction to Apache Cassandra. We discussed it with features, but how it all works. All servers are created equal. What does that mean? Traditional architecture of the database management systems follow master-slave or leader-follower architecture. Uh, and that means what there is one server, you can both write and read, and there are other servers you can read only. Uh, first of all, so this architecture is not bad per se. This architecture for many kind of uh, problems, for many kind of architectures and projects may be a good fit. Why? Because it logistically very simple. It's very easy to organize these and it's very easy to manage these. So there is plenty of uh, benefits, but also some downsides would make it unavailable basically for our project, for Apache Cassandra. First of all, it introduced single point of failure. As long as your master is out, you cannot do your work anymore. You are, your application basically is down. Second, it's hard to impossible to scale for writes. Scale for reads is easy. Launch new server and uh, go have fun. Launch new follower and you have your scalability for reads. But try to have it for writes, no fun, only vertical scaling. Vertical scaling gets expensive very soon, and vertical scaling also at some points just not possible, as you cannot have multiple masters on different regions, right? Having it as a single cluster. And finally, application needs to know where to write. If you try to write to a follower, you will get an exception. Like, man, are you dumb? Uh, don't write to follower. I can do it. Then Cassandra is peer-to-peer -peer masterless. All nodes communicate with all nodes. Each node is capable of answering your query. That doesn't mean what each node store all data. It's not possible. We speak about petabytes of data, like really a lot of data. So data is split into chunks and stored over different servers. But even if you ask node what doesn't store your data, it knows which one stores and it will redirect your question, combine all the information for you and give you the answer, even if it doesn't have your data. So. No single point of failure. It scales both for writes and reads because every node is capable of executing write request or at least coordinating write request if it's not a replica. And finally, application can contact any node, uh, which gives us again this high availability thing. In case of failure, just ask next node what your driver will do for you automatically. Question. So far, you are doing good like many uh, good answers. And th yeah. Thank you, uh, Jose. Uh, how many master nodes for a Cassandra cluster? Minimum three, three per data center, full replica divided by three, uh, no master nodes at all. So time is almost over. Thank you everyone for answering my questions. I love it. Time is up, and yes, right answer, there are no master uh -huh. nodes. You see, there are still three nice. people who cannot believe in that. 
They are so used to traditional architecture. No people, no Vera, no master. There is no definition of master. Or if you take it differently, you can think of each node as a master node. Uh, good. So let's move to the next one. Oops, looks like I occasionally launch next question. Oh my God, sorry guys, I pushed the wrong, okay. Yeah, let, let's stick to this, I will ask it again. So data is partitioned. Very well, what does that mean? So first of all, in Cassandra, data organizes in tables. There are plenty of people who think what NoSQL is schemaless. Again, bullshit. NoSQL tries to group multiple very different kind of databases, graph databases, uh, white column databases, key value databases, ledger databases. They are different. You don't group them. So the definition of NoSQL is pretty harmful, if you ask me. But so, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean that. I mean that. Uh, I really, uh, three hours workshop, introduction to NoSQL. We speak about different databases. We create schemas. We work with tables. We define like very strict requirements for our schemas. Three hours later, I ask students, is NoSQL schemaless? Like every third student answers, yes, no SQL is schemaless. Were you listening to me at all? Like, come on, man. Yeah, uh, the uh, idea for me is, okay, we will speak about that next time we meet, uh, is uh, in Cassandra, Cassandra is schema full. Actually, even Mongo is uh, not schemaless. Mongo is a flexible schema. Uh, it's just marketing bullshit, but okay. Uh, Sensors by network is our table, our data we are going to work today. Uh, we will speak about multiple sensors, measuring temperature and se sending this result to our database. So in Cassandra, we work with tables and that is create table sensor by network, which will have network name like state, for example, or area or factory this sensor is deployed. Then uh, sensor ID and uh, temperature, current temperature, why integer is it actually sh must be float, I guess, but okay, let's say integer. So that is a table we are going to work with. And that is a data center of seven servers, uh, Cassandra um, data center, which stores this table. How this data is being stored? Data is organized into tables and uh, data is stored as distributed tables. So basically you see, uh, each server is responsible for part of your data. And then, um, as you can see here, each server can store one or many partitions, and each partition has part of your data. How that works? Idea is it's a key-based partitioning, so when you create a table, you must define partition key. We will explore more about partition key in the end of this session. But for now, you just need to remember what partition key is the first property of a primary key, and that defines exactly how data will be partitioned. So here you see, I have a network as a partition key. That means what records or rows with the same partition key will be grouped together. Alabama, Alabama, California, California, Kansas, Kansas, and so on. So idea is pretty simple, we split data into chunks. How it works internally, again, you are engineers um, and you need to know how it works. Idea is uh, partition key value is being hashed uh, by a partitioner, uh, which uses currently in modern Cassandra, it uses more and more free hashing algorithm. More and more free hashing algorithm um, is a very simple thing. It takes whatever value you give to it and generates an integer value out of a pretty wide range. And uh, so Alabama becomes 59, Idaho becomes 12, and so on. And then in your data center, uh, each Cassandra node is responsible for range of those tokens. So for example, we see here what first server is responsible for a quarter of our, uh, because we have four nodes, second for quarter, third for quarter, fourth for quarter approximately. Uh, notice usually those numbers are not like 59 or 12 or 45, of course. Usually those are huge, huge integers, like very long. But uh, in this case, 
we just to simplify it, we will stick to short numbers, okay, from one to 100. Um, so when, as you could guess, it's very easy already to understand what if Alabama becomes 59, and then 59 belongs to the third node because it's uh, the range. This node is responsible for the token range, which token fits in. And uh, 12, so Idaho goes very far to the first node, and Hawaii 45 goes to the second node, and fourth node is currently unemployed, let's say, stores no data on this small table. Um, <laughs> Yvonne asks, uh, hi, Yvonne, by the way, um, question, a question for a quiz. What was the partitioning algorithm before Murmur? That is a really advanced and <laughs> good one. Yes. Uh, was it byte order? Uh, I don't remember at the moment here, yeah, like, uh, good. So why partitioning is used? Again, people, this uh, algorithm, this thing helps us with scaling a lot. But it also brings a lot of problems we will discuss soon. So why to introduce no problems and new problems? Because we have one bigger to solve. We have to be able, you remember our uh, limitations, uh, defining requirements from the very beginning, we have to be able to handle data of any size. What is a big data? Big data, there are many of scientific definitions, but I like the simple one from more of applied field. Big data is a data what does not fit a single server, simple as that. Uh, maybe you don't publish a uh, definition like that on Wikipedia, uh, right? <laughs> uh, but it's uh, pretty easy to explain. So splitting our data in chunks, we can spread them over more and more and more, dozens, hundreds, thousands servers, adding more when needed. That's why we do partitioning, to handle data of any size. Now, there is a very uh, interesting mechanism called a token ranges recalculation. Uh, the idea is Cassandra nodes uh, on your data center responsible for parts of the overall big token range. Uh, we see here what we have for nodes data center, which is for every node responsible for approximately a quarter of your data. Then let's say we work at e-commerce company and there's Black Friday is coming or Christmas sales are coming, or whatever interesting thing and it's coming, or we are Netflix and we are releasing last episode of Game of Thrones. And we know what our infrastructure at the moment is not capable of handling the peak load what comes soon. When we just launch a new server and add it to the cluster, say, there is a cluster, go join it. Then all operations basically happen automatically. Uh, you need to give your permission for bootstrapping, but uh, that's uh, overall, all the operations are automated. New node joins the cluster. What leads to a token range recalculation? Before, every node was responsible for a quarter. Now, every node is responsible for approximately 20 persons, right? That leads to data being streamed to the new node, and as a result, as token ranges are narrower, uh, each node is responsible for a smaller amount of data. And we are good, we can process uh, more operations now with that. Then finally, last episode of Game of Thrones is uh, streamed. Everyone is disappointed. No one is watching Netflix anymore. And we don't, we have too much servers. We are paying for them. Netflix aggressively uses AWS and they're paying quite a lot for their infrastructure. There are, there are some crazy numbers. Uh, so when we go, uh, we want to uh, downscale, actually, we don't need so much. And we tell to cluster, hey, I'm going to take down those two servers. Then token ranges will be recalculated again. Each server will be responsible for approximately a third of your partitions, uh, token ranges, sorry, token ranges. And therefore data will be streamed to a new replica servers. You can take down two servers, done. And if any of you is connected uh, with operations on the databases and familiar with sharding, for example, or operations over relational databases, they know what usually any operations of a server may very often um, mean downtime. And that's not a thing uh, with Cassandra. All operations are live. Database stays uptime all that time. So it's not interruptive uh, and it's automated what I like the most. I am a lazy engineer. If database can do my work for me, that always makes me happy. Question. 
I hope I can request this question again. Yeah, looks like I can. How data for a table is distributed? Each server has all data, one table on one server, by partitions, by shards. Uh, meanwhile, okay, let me first answer this question. Oh, thank you, Stefano. I see you guys are already owning all the questions. All right. Yeah, so, I mean, there is much to say, but probably that's a bit of a side yeah. advanced topic for now, for today. But I'll, mm -hmm. I'll mention one side thing in the chat. Yep. Uh, in short, uh, streaming process doesn't interrupt cluster, cluster performance. Uh, I, there is a question of Sidant, uh, Deepak, uh, when the rebalancing is happening, is the cluster usable or will perform less efficiently? So cluster is usable. Uh, but if you, for example, have uh, 10 servers in your data center and you launch 10 more, then there is going to be a lot of data shuffling. And uh, obviously nodes will be busy bootstrapping, streaming, and so on and so forth. So the overall idea is you better launch one node at a time or two nodes at a time, one by one. And only when the node is ready, you introduce a new one. Um, you can try to do more, but it may be potentially dangerous or cluster busy with rebalancing. Uh, that is a short uh, answer to this. Good, so most of you made it. Oh, not most of you, all of you people, you are totally lovely. Thank you so much. That's great. Let's get uh, back then. Yep. There's also a nice question about the difference between partition and sharding. That's mm -hmm. a good question. <laughs> yeah, that is a great so, question. Yeah. Uh, who uh, asked it? Sorry? Uh, who asked this question about difference? Uh, sit down partition? again. Okay. Oh, man, you are rocking with your questions. Thank you. Yes. So the idea, uh, they answer the same problem. A uh, problem is when you have uh, two big data what doesn't fit single server, you have to split it into chunks, you have to put them into different servers. So they answer the same problem, but answer is different. Um, sharding on relational databases is very painful manual downtime process. When you uh, manually identify shards, define them, move them, databases down, nothing works, it, it slowly, it requires a lot of operations in your participation. And that usually happens in the end. Over time, your data evolves, you have more and more data, then you go sharding. Um, one of the easiest and best answers of when you should consider Cassandra is if you do sharding on relational database, when you should consider Cassandra already. Um, now, Partitioning uh, is a native uh, from the beginning by design a process what is automated uh, and uh, executed automatically. Uh, yes, uh, sharding is really painful even with uh, non even with no relational databases like Mongo. Yeah, right. Uh, by the way, uh, people don't uh, miss this chance. Uh, with us is Aaron Plots, uh, which is one of the best Cassandra experts and a book after. Um, I don't remember the name, Aaron. What was the book you wrote about Cassandra? And will yes. you work on the next edition for Cassandra version 4 releasing presently? There are some changes, major changes. Or you know what? I have better uh, idea. There are some major changes coming in Cassandra version 5, 5 which comes in more or less August next year. So uh, think about uh, updating it uh, next year, I would say. Uh, like writing one right now, it means just you have to rewrite uh, that uh, in next year. Well, if it sells, it's still good. <laughs> uh, yep. Yeah. So I keep asking questions. Yeah, good. that's a good excuse to mention that uh, there are a few very cool features coming for Cassandra in the mid near future. So stay yeah. tuned. Yeah. <laughs> good. So. First thing I want to mention here is data is replicated. That is a very important thing. Uh, without replication, basically you never can have proper uh, reliability. Uh, without replication, you cannot have uh, your database being available all the time. So that's not a question to us. We need to have the data replicated. There is no other way to get data available all the time. Uh, uh, there is a question about version 5. Um, <laughs> no, ah, nice. 
a release uh, cycle is changed for Apache Cassandra. After yeah. a very slow release, very late release of Cassandra version 4, our community and uh, PMC, uh, the committee of the Apache Sapphire Foundation working on Cassandra, agreed uh, on the release cycle of uh, BWeekly. Uh, so it uh, will be fixed time flexible features, uh, not like before, and we expect 5.0 uh, be released in August 2023, actually. There is no uh, decided ETA because you see, uh, we need databases used in production by giants and data needs to be consistent. Everything have to be extremely stable. So we cannot just release a new version as so many projects Many projects, many front-end like JavaScript libraries being released daily. We cannot afford that. Yes, but there are ACID transactions coming in Cassandra version 5. And that is absolutely incredible. Yeah, you that's waited worth for next year. the wait. Yes. Absolutely worth the wait. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, yeah, and Apple wants to have 5.0 basically tomorrow, <laughs> yesterday. Good. So let's go. <laughs> Enough of discussing of the future. Data is replicated. What does that mean for us? Uh, there is a thing called a replication factor. Replication factor means count of the nodes used to store each row or better to say partition, each partition. Uh, when you create a key space, and key space is just nothing but a group of tables. Uh, so when you create, for example, schema in Postgres, you can create tables in this schema. So key space is basically the schema of uh, Cassandra. Um, so key space, when you create a key space, you must define three things. Uh, name, pretty obvious, replication strategy, and replication factor. First of all, easiest uh, is a name. I don't want to stop on that. Then replication factor. Replication factor means how many copies of this partition I'm going to have per data center. In this case, you see I have United States West 1, three replicas, and United uh, in Europe is 2, five replicas. Like it's going to be more hostile environment, and I want to have higher reliability there. Uh, now, a uh, network topology strategy is an interesting thing. Uh, so class of the replication, there are two possible classes at the moment, simple strategy and network topology strategy. Simple strategy is good for your laptop, but bad for anything else. Simple as that. The network topology strategy is a strategy what understands, quite a surprise, network topology, right? Um, so. Network topology basically is the topology of your network. I'm being so obvious today with servers uh, in different server racks on different data centers. Or if you deploy in cloud, uh, so it will be different regions, different availability zones. Idea of the network topology strategy is to keep your replicas away from each other. Uh, easiest explanation is like when you do a backup of your hard disk, you are not going to store this backup on the same hard disk, right? Otherwise, if this hard disk is destroyed, you will have no access to backup. It just makes no sense. If you make a backup, you store it in different place. Same with topologies, network topology strategy. It puts replicas of your data into different places. So if you have three server racks, it will put one replica on each uh, rack because servers in the rack tend to fail together because of power outage or network outage, for example. Uh, for uh, clouds, as said, uh, the same goes to availability zones. Uh, then uh, there is an interesting question, catchy question. Uh, if this statement is uh, correct and there are no mistakes and it will be executed successfully, based on this statement, tell me how many data centers I have how many data centers I have based on this statement. Stefano, please give no hints. You know the answer. I want uh, to see some answers on YouTube chat. <laughs> now, I'm busy writing in the chat, actually, but I got an error writing a, an answer for yep. some two, reason. Two, 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 two. So there is no simple, uh, like each problem has simple, obvious, uh, quick, wrong uh, answer. Uh, story is right answer is at least two. 
because I can have more than two data centers. I can have a dozen of data centers. But you know, there are some laws or regulations in different regions what you need to store data of your, for example, German customers in Germany, GDPR. Uh, same, I believe, goes for some things uh, in the United States and so on and so forth. So I can have more data centers, but in some of them, I may not be allowed to store this data or simply I don't need it. If this data is used only by my European branch, I don't want to have copy of this data in the uh, Australia, maybe in the United States uh, for reliability purposes, but not in all of my data centers. I just don't need it. So right answer is at least two. Good. So with replication factor one, I'm going to have one partition in unique way uh with replication factor two two nodes and recommended replication factor is replication factor three um i know some scenarios where companies go to five uh, but usually that means very hostile environment with unreliable network and in general recommended replication factor is free so each node each uh, sorry each row or to say partition better store it three times Obviously, that leads to a higher disk space consumption. But you know what? Disk space is cheap. What is priceless is your reputation. So we speak about companies what really care about their reputation. Then joining it all together, partitioning and replication. Uh, it's very easy idea. Just each server is responsible not for single token range, but for multiple token ranges for different partitions. So for example, with replication factor two, this server will be responsible for its own token range and token range of its neighbor and so on and so forth. Uh, and now how it works, then data arrives, like you write new data to your database. It gets to one of the servers and this server becomes a query coordinator. So it will coordinate operations for this query. This server is not a replica server for this partition. This one, this one, and this one are. Uh, and the idea here will be what query coordinator will then dispatch free writes to free replica servers to store this data, and then data is delivered, and we are happy, and everyone is happy. Very important thing, each Cassandra node and each even Cassandra driver, or at least most of them, understand data allocation in the cluster. It's called a token aware. So they understand token ranges and which server responsible for which token range. So your application can contact literally any server and then this server will work as a query coordinator and dispatch your query to a proper servers. But under normal circumstances, driver will contact replica node. So this situation usually never happens because usually your driver, your application will contact not this blue node, but one of those three doing round robin balancing. Like uh, recently, I was uh, helping some people on a Cassandra uh, chat in Telegram, and uh, uh, we occasionally found out what one of the Cassandra users put their Cassandra cluster behind HR proxy to have round robin balancing. And that is a very sad and disappointing, disappointing situation because people just killing their own cluster, disabling heavy token, all the token uh, aware optimizations, just because we don't read documentations. You don't need a proxy balancer in front of your Cassandra cluster. Cassandra clients, mostly wrote by data stacks, will do their own wrong robin balancing using token aware optimizations. So you do not have need to have any HR proxy or Nginx or whatever in front of your cluster. It's taken care of already. Good. And then final thing, data is globally distributed, but we discussed it already, so I don't want to stop on that for so long. Data is placed on multiple regions or even multiple clouds. Uh, Stefano? Yes. I think that's your turn now. Ah, Let's awesome. push some buttons. So that's Let great. me switch to your screen and I will drink some water now. Nice. Uh, are you sharing your screen? Um, yes, I am. I think Good. it should be all ready. Perfect. Okay. So, uh, okay. So I'll keep an eye on YouTube to make sure our, our faces are not blocking the view too much. 
because yeah, so you've been seeing uh, a lot of uh, how Cassandra works and how awesome it is. I think now it's time to play a bit with it, right? So, oh, thank you for moving around. Uh, okay. <laughs> OK, so uh, maybe we ask our dear Nightbot to drop the link to GitHub again. Yes, we'll we do. Starting. So please keep a tab open on that one. Oh, uh, you did already. As, yes, as we mentioned already, um, we have a nice repository with all instructions to go through this practice yourself and also find and more information. The slide deck, it's all there. So um, bookmark this for later use as well. OK, so there is a lot of stuff in this readme because that's also mm, intended for uh, folks who come across the readme without the workshop. That's why we are going to skim through parts of it and do the practice. But first, you need a database. So what we do, um, it would be a bit complicated for you to just, uh, in the small time of this workshop, to just start your own Cassandra cluster. So that's why today we are going to use AstroDB. Uh, AstroDB is, well, uh, we try to make it very short. AstroDB is a software, is a database as a service ready for you in the cloud, managed for you by data stuffs, and it is serverless. That means uh, that it's basically built on Cassandra, so it works as you can interact with it as you would with your own Cassandra installed in your own machines, but you don't have uh, to care about operations, maintenance, uh, provisioning the servers and all that. So it's, and because, well, it's also serverless. So um, actually it's very convenient also in terms of resources. Speaking of resources, the nice news is that AstroDB is um, gives you a very generous free tier. So for example, today I will show you how to create uh, an account and then a database there. And uh, you will just stay in the free tier, which, well, it's not only just for playing around, but it will be, well, it will give you the possibility to actually run uh, even small production workloads, no problem. That's because it's a few tens of um, million of operations per month for free and also uh, quite some storage, as you can see here in the readme, it's all explained. So that was by way of introduction. And the first thing I suggest, I hope you are all with me uh, in the readme. I'm scrolling down to start hands on here. And the first step is we create our database instance. So the first thing is you see this big orange button. This is where uh, you would be led to AstroDB to register, to create your your, inst your account. Uh, you can use user password or you can log in with, uh, I think, Google or GitHub as you wish. Now, of course, I already do have an instance, uh, an, an account, so I will skip this step. Let me, and I'm going a bit slow because you will have to just provide a few values in the field when you register but in the meantime i made my uh, window over github on the side so i will start showing you what happens when you are logged in in astrodb so please go ahead click on this button probably in a opening a new tab to keep the readme available and you will have to register to astrodb and when you're done this is what you'll see. You will see the AstroDB dashboard and probably there will be no databases yet. You see here, no databases yet. And also here, well, this will be a list of your databases, but of course you will not have any as I am now showing. So please, oh, let's get clear with the messages. So uh, maybe it's a good time to ask you uh, if you manage to create your AstroDB your Astra account, uh, maybe you can give me a thumbs up in the chat. We will wait a couple of minutes, maybe something like that. Um, so again, we are going to play a bit with the database today. Um, of course, there is much more. Oh, great, sit down, you're done. So you, thank you. I'll wait another 30 seconds or so. I mean, registration should be pretty easy. Jose, great, well done. Okay, so um, 
there is a lot you can do with Astra. Uh, actually, there is a lot you can do with Cassandra. And of course, today we are just scratching the surface. But as uh, Nightbot uh, periodically reminds us, we have uh, weekly workshops which cover a lot, uh, a lot ways, a lot of ways you can use uh, Cassandra, a lot of ways you can interact with NoSQL databases, and even we we also touch on even uh, other technologies from AI to Airflow and and back so please uh, you can if you're interested you can join us in other workshops and there is always something more to learn okay so um i'll assume we can go forward and if any of you are uh, still having trouble creating the account please uh, maybe reach us in the chat or just uh, go to the to the readme in asynchronously and then reach us uh, on Discord or anything to discuss on, or to troubleshoot. Okay, so this is your, your main AstraDB uh, Astra dashboard, and you see there are no databases. So I'll bounce back and forth with the readme just to have the instructions. It's time to create a database. Okay, um, to do that, guess what? There is a nice button, create database. So if you click on it, you will be uh, asked a few fields. How do you want your database to be named and today i suggest you to stick with the standard names and usually for workshops we create a database called workshops uh, key space there was a question in the chat um so key space as alex said is just uh well it's a bit more but let's say it's mostly a group of tables so it's a logical place where we will be creating a number of tables to keep them grouped, we assign them to a key space. And today, the, the key space is called sensor data. I'm spelling it right. Yes, as you see here in the readme, please call your key space sensor data. And now uh, there is the last part, ask, where do we want the database to be created uh, for you? So um, if you have preferences, if your application API, whatever server are going to live in a given cloud provider, you probably are, you're probably better creating the database in the same uh, provider and hopefully in the same region for optimal uh, performance. Or you can also have multi-region deployments. That's not a topic for today, but uh, let's stick to Google Cloud because this is what the free tier uh, uh, offers open to you. Uh, on a freshly created account. So please stick to Google Cloud here provider and pick any region you want. And of course, again, some regions are not open uh, uh, to a freshly created free tier account. So I'll stick to the US East one, which is available. So we are ready, database name, key space name, and then you choose a provider and a region here. Then. Of course, you create the database with this button, create a database here on the right. Let me click it and it will take maybe two, three minutes to create the database. In the meantime, uh, you can track the progress of the creation and you will you are also given uh, something called token. Well, that's a very important uh, piece of uh, information for you, for your application, because the the database is uh, out there in the cloud and you need some credentials to uh, access it, to do any operation with it. So this would be uh, your way, your key to access the database from, let's say, your drivers or your application, whatever it does. But in general, you, at this point, we say keep your token, store it in a safe place and blah, blah, blah. And of course, that's something we suggest today in case you later want to go the route of writing an application and whatnot. But I think today's practice is just done here in the browser and it's automatically done. Uh, so the, the connection to your database is provided uh, behind the scenes. So today, actually, you don't even need this token, but maybe it's a good idea to uh, store it for another time. That being said, you will be able to create as many tokens as you need with different permissions and configure uh, the, the, the power they have. But that's, again, not a topic for today. Uh, in the meantime, I see my database has become active. So I guess many of you also have your database active. Maybe you can tell me as much in the chat. If your database is active, then I feel better in moving forward at this point. 
see. Okay, very good. So, Alex, where do we stop with this part of the practice? With... Uh, I think we are done. Okay. Okay, so, uh, okay, good to go. Uh, actually, this is where we stop and we jump back to the slides for the second part of, of the practice. Mm -hmm. We will make sure your databases Commission. are all active. Yes. So, in case time. you have to catch up, sorry. In case you have to catch up, the instructions are here and we will resume from here with our database ready to go. I'll, let me just click go to database, which brings me to the dashboard for my newly created workshop database. And we will start from here. Back to you, Alex. Thank you. Cool. So give me a moment. Boom. And perfect. So uh, most of the things, uh, so we, today we speak about open source Apache Cassandra. Uh, so I don't want to stop on Astra for uh, too long, but the general idea is um, Astra uh, is a, a software as a service platform uh, currently featuring Apache Cassandra as a service and Apache Pulsar as a service. Most of you may uh, never met a Pulsar before. You can think of Pulsar as Kafka on steroids. Um, yeah, I believe that's a pretty well comparison. And uh, it has very generous free tier, so you can use it for your actually even small to like small production workloads, totally free. And it has zero login, so you can go to AWS or Google Cloud still using open source technologies, but managed by CAS professionals, as uh, currently Datastax consists of uh, one of the, it has one of the best Cassandra teams in the world, that's for sure. And the same goes for, for Pulsar. But anyway, let's go further and we will speak a bit about a distributed architecture. And now it's your turn to answer what is the biggest problem of replication? What is the biggest problem of replicated data? Biggest problem of replicated data is increased disk space consumption, more network transactions, or potential cross-node inconsistency. What do you think? That's always a good question to ask. Yeah. And I'm all curious. Okay. So, first of all, I tricked you. Uh, those uh, questions technically all valid, uh, those answers, those options uh, to answer are all valid. They all are a potentially big problem of replicated data. With replicated data, you have increased disk space consumption. With mere replicated data, you do have more network transactions. You still have to write to three different servers, for example. But the biggest problem is potential cross-node inconsistency indeed. You see, disk space, like there was a very good phrase, if you can solve the problem with money, it's not a problem, it's an expense, uh, or those are costs. The idea is Cassandra is usually used by projects what have, what have money. And then this increased disk space consumption is just a question of some zeros on the bill, and they can handle that. Reputation is priceless, disk space is cheap. Uh, but potential cross-node consistency can be a real, really, really, really sneaky problem. So let's talk about that. What is the potential cross-node inconsistency? The story is when you have uh, different uh, servers storing the same data, you need always to update information on all of them. If network operation never reached one of the servers, it may get the stale data, outdated information. And that's something we have to avoid. You don't want uh, your bank account to have inconsistent data, right? So Cassandra is used by many banks. How do they handle consistency? First of all, it's a problem of each and every distributed system, uh, or not necessarily distributed. Even if you have your cache, if you introduce cache for a single host, application, you still may run into the problem of a consistency cache to real value. So cache and validation can be very, very tricky on the big deployments on a distributed cache and so on. So Cassandra features layered self-defense 
and there are multiple ways uh, to answer this problem. Uh, first mechanism what comes into the game is hinted handoffs. Idea of a hinted handoff is very simple. Then query coordinator writes data. If one node doesn't answer, query coordinator will store so-called hint or hinted handoff. It's a persistent data on disk, so it will survive uh, restart of the node. And as soon as server learns what this node is recovered, hint will be delivered, and that happens fully automatically. How query coordinator uh, storing hinted handoff knows what node recovered? Because nodes are communicating all time uh, in between. There is a mechanism called gossiping. So uh, every node knows state of their neighbors. As soon as it knows what node recovered, hint will be delivered. And then consistency is recovered, and you can wake up in the middle, uh, you can wake up in the morning, find out what your server was out during the night, but now it's recovered and all the consistency and all the data is recovered and it's happened automatically and no one was uh, waking you up in the middle of the night, uh, go safe, our database application is down, customers are running away. It happened with me many times and I totally love the, with our databases and I just adore this mechanism in Cassandra. I really adore it, people. Uh, so yeah, but that's not enough because uh, we need uh, better um, safety on this. And there are multiple mechanisms. First one, hinted handoffs, I explained it already. Um, oh, good question, Siddhanta, I believe Stefano will uh, answer. So in short, there are other uh, yeah. layers of defense. First of them, hinted handoffs mechanism, we already discussed it, but that's not enough. Uh, there is a second mechanism, a repair on read, we will discuss soon. But those two happen fully automatically. It's Cassandra job. So I don't want to, st uh, to stop uh, for too long on them. We still have a lot of things to discuss. Then repairs is an admin job. As today's session is for developers, again, we will not talk about repairs. But the simple idea of repair is what Cluster compares uh, data, um, versions in over the cluster and if sees what one of the nodes is out of sync it will recover consistency by repair if you are responsible for database operations and you need to know more about that i strongly recommend uh, reaper uh, which is a great tool for cassandra reaper cassandra you can google it and uh, that's how you manage repairs or use Astra, and then you don't have to worry about that. Uh, so consistency levels is something uh, what developers are responsible for. So we will stop on consistency level, as it's very important to understand. But before we are getting there, we need to talk about whom to blame. And don't blame me. I did nothing wrong. It's all Eric Brewer to blame about uh, because he created the CEP theorem and now nothing works as we want it to work. Uh, if any one of you have ever heard of CEP theorem before, please uh, write something uh, in the chat. I don't know, maybe thumbs up or OK or anything. So we will know what were people aware of that. Uh, meanwhile, I want to explain. So CAP theorem operates three features, and we need to discuss those features. It is availability, consistency, and partition tolerance. Availability is the simplest one to explain. Availability means uptime. You ask a question, you get the answer, your system is, up, uh, is available. If you doesn't get the answer, your system is not highly available. Uh, then consistency, we discussed it already. Consistency means no stale data. If you ask something, you get the most recent value, database is consistent. If you ask something and get outdated information, your system is inconsistent. Then partition tolerance is the most misunderstood concept of CEP. So let's uh, stop on that for a moment. Many people think, well, oh, so first, partition tolerance is ability of a system to survive network partitioning. So to understand partition tolerance, we need to understand network partitioning first. What is a network partitioning? Please notice what in this case partitioning has no relation to our uh, partitions we mentioned before for Cassandra, but the idea of a partitioning is uh, simple. There is a group of your servers in a data center, what are up and available 
and they cannot be accessed by customers, but they cannot access second part of your service in a data center. And there is a second group of servers in your data center what are up, running, and available to customers, but cannot be accessed uh, by group A and cannot access group A, like uh, right here. Group A up, running, available. Group B up, running, available. They cannot communicate in between, but customers can communicate with uh, group A or group B. And that, um, first of all, very often misunderstood idea. People think what group B is just not available for anyone. If group B is not available for anyone, it's called it how? Downtime. Simple downtime because of the network uh, issues that happens. People think what downtime is the worst, what can happen with your database. But that is a mistake because there are more dangerous things than just downtime. Some of you may now uh, wonder, like, what do you mean there are things worse than downtime? Downtime, uh, database not working, application is not working, customers are crying, managers are swearing, and like everything is on fire. What can be worse? Very easy, people. Split brain can. What is a split brain? Uh, split brain is a situation, for example, in a relational database, it would look like that. Imagine we work with a relational database with failover enabled. Failover as a mechanism of a re-election of a new master is previous master is unavailable. Then let's say that was a master and that was follower, 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 follower. And then there is a network uh, partitioning, so they cannot communicate. This group behaves as before. Master, follower, follower, follower. This group of two followers enables re-election. And they create a new master. And now this is a master. If your application starts to write to this guy, you are deep in troubles. Because now part of your operations served by this master, part of your operations served by this master. And that's called it a split brain. And there is no way to handle it automatically. So let your application run like this for a couple of hours or days. And then you will spend months trying to understand uh, what operation should be executed, how to merge them. There is no tools, basically, to handle such a situation. It all will require manual job. For a highly loaded applications, uh, like whatever Apple deployments, whatever deployments, basically, any big company, E, that is a real problem. So split brain is a disaster, much worse than downtime. You better go downtime than split brain. OK, so when partition tolerance is the ability of a distributed system to survive network partition. Done with that. Now let's go to the theorem, theorem by itself. CP theorem is a very simple idea. The job can be done quick and in a good quality and cheap, and you can pick any two of them. A uh, job can be done uh, in a good quality and quick, but it's not going to be cheap. And if job is done cheap and quick, it ain't going to have a uh, good quality. Same with CEP theorem. In distributed environment, in case of emergency, you can have only two guaranteed qualities out of three. And as we cannot sacrifice partition tolerance by no costs, uh, then we basically speak about AP databases, highly available and partition tolerant, and CP databases, consistent and partition tolerant, CP, but not highly available. And uh, there are some solutions for CP databases, there are some solutions for AP databases. Now, people often say what Cassandra is AP database, and that is, that is a mistake again. Cassandra is configurably consistent, so Cassandra can be uh, in CP or AP mode for different kinds of data, depending on the data you have. We have two primary tools to uh, configure uh, consistency there. Imagine having uh, replication factor one. Replication factor one brings you here. You don't have any replicas. That means you are consistent. Uh, but obviously, as soon as this replica goes down, on which may happen totally, then you don't have any access to this data. You cannot store, you cannot retrieve. You are not highly available. You are CP. So with replication factor, we can set uh, to CP mode, but uh, there are another tool to understand. Consistency level. What is the consistency level? Consistency level 
is the amount of uh, acknowledgements you will wait before database will dispatch a response. What are those acknowledgements? Then you write a uh, data, uh, you can specify consistency level one. That means what with replication factor three, we will wait for one and only one answer from the replica. That means what we still, of course, store data to all three replicas, but as soon as first of them answers, we immediately dispatch answer to a client. So it is kind of a fastest way to store your data. There is only one way faster, which is any, but it's too aggressive. Uh, so I don't want you to risk. Um, consistency level one will wait for one confirmation. As our uh, write queries usually go directly to one of the replicas, one is considered to be done as soon as replica persists with data. So it's kind of a fastest. Why kinda? Because if all nodes are running fast, then all of them will answer more or less quick. And then there will be no difference if you wait for all of our, uh, confirmations from all replicas, all your wait for one. Uh, but let's take a look at our consistency levels. When you write your data or read your data, you can say quorum. Quorum means majority. So half and a little bit more of the replicas. As I have replication factor three, that means uh, my quorum will be equal to, of course. So that's why we usually speak about replication factor three, five, so a number like that, because quorum is cheaper. Um, and then we go for quorum, that means what we will wait for two confirmations with replication factor three. So most of the servers got my update. And then finally, with consistency level all, uh, we will wait for confirmations of all of the replicas. Uh, so free acknowledgements or free confirmations from all replicas what I have. And now you may say, oh, yeah, I love consistency level all. I want my data to be always consistent. So I will uh, go for consistency level all always. And there is a little problem with that. CAP theorem is not canceled, you know. As soon as you go uh, for consistency level all, you bring your database into CP state. Uh, so OK, it's consistent and partition tolerant, but it's not highly available anymore. And as soon as you wait for all confirmations, but one server is extremely slow, it will be very low, a very slow. Or if one of the servers is down, when you get an exception, cannot reach desired consistency level, try again later, better luck next time. Best part of the consistency levels is what they are on per query basis. So if you specify replication factor of a key space, then consistency level can be set for each query. For example, here we see some Java. I remember some of you using Java, so it must look familiar. We make prepared statement with session prepare, insert into product, blah, 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 values, blah, blah, blah. And then to this prepared statement, I can set consistency level. Let it be consistency level one. And I can execute this query. Then I can execute this query with different consistency level. So, for example, you can think if you totally need to write your data and you cannot say uh, to your customer, try again later, we are having issues. You can, for example, thinking of executing query with a higher consistency level. And then uh, if desired consistency level cannot be reached, you may soften requirements and uh, go from quorum to one, for example. This strategy can be dangerous. So in general, use it with a very high touch cautiousness. It may be a very, it's a very advanced case. So Cassandra can be tricky. Uh, on the example, a little bit lower, you see uh, us working in Cassandra query language shell, what you will do very soon, where we can set consistency, uh, get consistency with command consistency. We see what it's set to quorum and we can change, for example, to all, well, to set to all. Good. Uh, well, then, now, there is a question. Can we try to get as close as possible to the center? I mean, like, okay, center is unreachable, but can we try to get very, very, very close to the center as maximum as possible? Answer is yes. There is a solution known as immediate consistency. Immediate consistency, speaking uh, scientifically, is a pretty simple idea. If your consistency level of a write 
plus consistency level of a read is higher than replication factor, your data is immediately consistent. What does that mean? Imagine me writing data with consistency level quorum and reading data with consistency level quorum. First of all, I write data with replication factor free consistency level quorum. Client writes to node, node dispatches free writes. And let's imagine this uh, bad guy went down and not available and not responding. Still, so we technically we have downtime. If it would be a master server uh, on these uh, traditional databases, our application would be totally unavailable. But we are better than that. We are better than downtime. So data is stored using two replica factors. Now this one recovers, but let's say for any reason, a hinted handoff didn't reach their goal. So one of the mechanisms of a layer of defense, actually even two consistency levels and repair and read. Now I read data and I read also with consistency level quorum. There are two possible scenarios. This server will answer faster or this server will answer faster. If this server answers faster, when we have quorum here, so this is a replica, this is a replica, we have quorum, we have up-to-date uh, information and client gets up-to-date information. That is a boring scenario. Like everything works as expected. Let's speak troubles. Let's imagine this uh, bad guy was faster and it gave wrong answer. No, not wrong, but stale, right? Outdated. Then in that situation is more interesting. This server sees what data is not matching. Actually, not even data, but data digests. Because sometimes you work with big data, you don't want to transfer it all multiple times for no need. If this server has the same and, this, and they all have the same, it makes no sense to transfer them, making your network busy. So actually, those servers by default sending only the digests, uh, short, very short values. If digests are matching, we return to the client. But in this case, we see it's not. Digest doesn't match. This value is not updated here. Then the query coordinator compares timestamps. It always knows when data was written. It sees what this data is uh, more up to date, the data it stores. Then it returns this data to a client and initiates repair for this partition. So partition will be repaired and uh, consistency of this server will be recovered automatically with no human participation. Magic. So, yeah, and by the way, as we speak about this uh, formula, uh, you technically can do the same with write all, read one, or uh, write one, read all. But as they include uh, consistency level all, that is again questioning our high availability and we're trying to be in the center. Uh, consistency levels you need to know. So uh, one quorum all, we discussed it already. Uh, two, three, basically very simple. You're just specifying exact number of the response you're waiting for. Uh, if your replication factor is different, it may make sense. Then two very important things, uh, ideas of local and each. First, uh, let's talk about local. Local one or local quorum. Local means closest data center. For example, if your application is deployed in the United States and Europe, you want a European uh, data center uh, based application. Server works with a database center also in Europe, not in the United States, right? So saying local one, you say work with uh, uh, we expect one confirmation from one local replica not we don't wait for american guys or it will be too slow and working with local quorum is exactly the same we will wait for quorum only of local replicas we will not wait for acknowledgements from replicas of our data centers we are going to be slow each quorum uh, it re will require to have quorum in each data center, so at least two nodes uh, in each data center, but that potentially can be very slow, of course, because you will have to wait for all the transatlantic, transpacific uh, communications, depends on your network topology and so on, but um, usually uh, you stick to locals. Okay, now questions, actually even two questions. First question, 
The CEP theorem says what on failure in case of emergency, C, A, and P are all guaranteed. If C fails, so do A and P. Only C, A, or C, P can be guaranteed, but not both of them simultaneously. You making the good team, people, so I expect it to be right. You made it. So CA or CP can be guaranteed, but you cannot have both in case of failure. That's awesome. Yeah, you are doing great. Nice. Then second question right away. Um, recommended consistency level for immediate consistency. Read, write, one, one. Read, write, one, all. Read, write, quorum, quorum. This is also a very important point. Let's see. Okay, time is almost over. Okay, so no, 1-1 one, one will not give you immediate consistency. 1-1 one, one is the most dangerous way. It may still may have use if you have a lot of operations and want to decrease amount of pressure on your database when you work with data of a secondary importance. Uh, in, I don't know, there are plenty of scenarios when you can afford losing uh, one answer for a short moment of a time, and then it's not a problem. But when you work with data of a primary importance, of a high importance, then you definitely want to have immediate consistency, and then you want to have forum forum, which is recommended. Technically, one all also gives you immediate consistency, but it's definitely not recommended. Now, the uh, stop no yeah i asked two two questions already right yes yeah i did good so let's get back uh stefano yes let me change my screen to you yes please it's time to run some cql yes, code you are live very good so um yeah um where were we we were at the dashboard for the newly created database. You see, there are a, a lot of things. You can click around and explore and see the various ways to interact with your database, monitor health, connect to it, uh, configure settings, and all sorts of things. Today, we are going to interact with the database first to create a table, right? So to start putting some data in it. OK, so to create tables, there are uh, various ways. Actually, to communicate with uh, Cassandra, there are various ways. Um, the most important is, so the native protocol supported by Cassandra is called CQL, which is Cassandra Q uh, query language. And uh, there you, you might just have a, a, a client that is a console speaking CQL over to your Cassandra. You can uh, have drivers for various programming languages using under the hood, this same protocol and speaking to uh, your database. And in the case of AstraDB, there is also a, a layer providing different ways to access your database, different APIs, such as a document API, GraphQL, and whatnot. But today, we're going to run plain, good Cassandra code, uh, CQL code, I mean. But the nice thing is that you don't have to install your client today on your computer, because in, within AstraDB, there is a nice console running in the in the browser for you to just type commands and see uh, what they do. And you're actually uh, writing and interacting with your database. So to you see this SQL console tab here, this one. If you click on SQL console tab here, a console is created for, for you. Now, I think the font can be made a bit bigger. So I'll try to large okay you can i should jump to the new interface to collapse the side panel but okay let's try okay that's not very important i'm just doing that in particular uh, to be able to collapse so this is um, changing mm -hmm to the newly rolled out UI just to be able to 
collapse the side panel and make it easier for you to see what I, I am doing. OK, so here, hopefully the, the, the font size is a bit bigger. And so this is a console like you would do, like you do, would have uh, uh, your own console in your machine, but this is running in the browser. And it understands the CQL Cassandra query language commands. Uh, CQL looks a bit like SQL, but of course, uh, I hope we have convinced you that by now um, we have convinced you that Cassandra is not a relational database. So <laughs> no surprise, the commands available are slightly different and not everything is supported. And so, for example, there are no joins, but some of the commands look very much similar to what you would use in SQL if you have some experience with that. So let's start by creating tables now. Um, Today's example, well, not that this is very important, but today's example is based on a fictional IoT network of sensors collecting measure, temperature measurements. And we, we have to think of tables to store these measurements. So there are networks of, of sensors and each sensor uh, supposedly sends periodically uh, temperature readings to the database server, which has to store them in the right way. That's not important, but actually we have um, follow up workshops about modeling the data and writing the application and they all build on, on this Internet of Things um, example. So that's why we. Uh, that's why I outlined uh, briefly outlined this this point. So. Um, first, we have to. Create the tables or be, even before that, uh, did you remember that we had key spaces? So we can ask SQL console to describe, to tell us which key spaces are there. And uh, how do you run commands in the SQL console? Well, you type them and you hit enter key. So for example, if I write desk, I'm trying desk key spaces. Uh, usually SQL commands have to end with a semicolon and then I'm hitting enter and you get, you see, we get the result. And well, looks like there are a lot of key spaces, but here there is our good sensor data. All the rest are system key spaces you should, should not even be concerned about. But the, the important point is that there is a key space called sensor data here. So we can tell the SQL console, please uh, use sensor data, which means from now on, every time I don't specify a key space, I'm working on that one. Uh, by the way, maybe I should show that to you because that's useful. Uh, Cassandra, so CQL console has tab completion, so I just write use send. And then if I hit the tab key, that's completed for me. So use sensor data, then I hit enter. And you see now I'm working on the sensor data key space. So uh, if I create a table, for example, this will be created within that key space. And that's exactly what I'm going to do. So I want to create a table called networks. See, this is a table uh, that will contain data to list which uh, networks of sensors exist in this system. So you see, um, here, here's the create table statement that we are about to run. And that looks almost like a SQL statement. So create table, well, if not exist, but create table, name, and then there are a bunch of columns with their data type. So name is a text, the description is a text, region is a text. And then there is a mention of the primary key. Now, uh, primary key is a bit different than what you would see in SQL. Maybe uh, this double, Parentheses will give you a hint, but let's first run this command. So I'm copying it and pasting it here in the console. As you are suggested to do all, all of you, you should do the same. So paste the command and hitting enter. Well, it looks like no error. So it looks like the table was created. How do we find out? Well, I, I can ask the console to desk tables. So short for describe tables, and sure enough, I see my networks table here. I can even desk table networks, and I will get back my create table statement. 
So the table is all good all there and also a bunch of settings related to how the table internally is, uh, how the storage works and all that. that. That's not for today, of course. OK, so um, that's not the only table in this um, IoT application because we need a table that lists which sensors are there for a given network and also uh, a table to store the individual reading of temperatures coming from the, the sensors. And that's why there are two additional create table statements which I'm going I'm, I'm going to, 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 to run. But before running them, if you look here, that's where the, import, the interesting part comes. You see this table all define a primary key. This also defines a primary key. And you see there is this funny thing. There is an internal parenthesis with, in this case, one column. And then uh, there's another column that appears in the outer parenthesis. Well, that's related to how partitioning works. So um, that will be seen later, but the, the, to make it very short, the innermost parenthesis contains the partition key. So that defines what rows, what data are going to be grouped together in a partition. And the rest here, sensor in this case and timestamp in this case, the rest is uh, the rest of the primary key basically. So what makes the row unique, but still uh, does not imply different partitions for storage. But okay, there, there will be more on that later. So let me just copy these commands here and paste them in the console. No questions asked. I'm just hitting enter. And I think it has worked. So if I do the other tables here, there are now three tables in my key space. You see? Then it looks like it's all good. Um, but, well, there is uh, there is a problem with this table. Actually, that was called temperatures by sensors bad. The reason is related to this partitioning. So, uh, of course, I'm a bit mm, jumping ahead because that is something Alex will show you mm, better later. But imagine readings come in and in over time with this application. Every sensor is sending new readings every time and they come with different timestamps. But a given sensor will send more and more and more data to store. Eventually, if you look at how the partitioning is done, so this all data from a given sensor end up in a single partition, sooner or later this partition will be incredibly big. And that's, of course, there are physical limitations on how big a partition can be. So this is not a good choice for a table. This is this eventually will become not performant. They, you will have the problem of giant partitions too big. So actually there is a trick that you will see in a slide in a little while, but uh, we can even drop the table. I'm not, I don't bother dropping the table now, but I want to create a, a table that will be the final table for this application, which is called temperatures by sensor. You see, there is no bad anymore. Let me paste this create command. And you see there is a slightly different choice of partitioning. I'm just leaving that here for you as uh, as a hint of what's coming next. And Alex will show you uh, more about how to properly design partitioning in tables. But the important thing is that now if I run my desk tables, I'll see, well, four tables in this case, including the bad one. But the important thing is that we have tables ready to uh, be written, read, and whatever. Um, yeah, so you might ask yourself, how come we designed the tables like that? Why, why should we have, why did we put sensor and not another column in the partition key and so on? This, of course, is a very big topic and it's the topic of um, data modeling. And that's uh, a huge important part of working with Cassandra. Uh, today, we are just going to mention that mostly. The idea is that you design the tables after thinking of what queries you want to run on the table. And that's my one liner about data modeling. We have entire courses on data modeling. So that's why I'm, I force myself to stop here on this topic. And I think it's back to you, Alex. Yes, looks like. Uh, thank you so much. Hands-on part is important, guys. Don't be lazy. Do it on your own. Uh, now, 
actually. Sorry. Yes. Okay. So last part, you are getting very close to the end. Tables and partitions. Uh, so let's go. Uh, how do you structure data? How do you work with data? Uh, it all starts with a cell, and cell is an intersection of row and column. Then row is a single structured data item in a table. That must be familiar to you. Then partition, and we don't have partitions in most of the modern databases, but we do in Cassandra, and never forget about partitions. Partitions never forget about you. So, group of rows having the same partition token, base unit of access in Cassandra. And then a table is a group of columns and rows storing partitions. Good. Data is organized as distributed tables, discussed. But closer to the keys, as it's a key-based partitioning, you decide how partition will be designed. A partition key is the first argument of a primary key. And that's a very important thing. A partition key basically will define how data is distributed over a cluster. And partition key decides of a size of a size of a partition. Uh, so in this case, for example, with data, we have a partition based on a sensor ID. In this case, we may have too many partitions over time. So maybe you could think about a different uh, model like sensor and timestamp being both parts of a partition key. Let's call it a composite partition key, and it's totally fine. Um, to have, uh, in this case, as timestamp is going to be unique, we will have as many, um, we will have as many rows, as many partitions, as many rows we will have, one row per partition. And that is totally fine per se. You may have as many partitions as you want, it's fine. But designing model, we need to think of three uh, limitations. First, we need to remember the size of the partition to avoid it being too big. Second, we need to think write time. And second, we need to think a read time. Uh, so how do we behave here on a write time? Can we write with data? Answer is yes. When sensor writes its data to a database, uh, we need to know sensor ID. Obviously, we do. And when we need to know when it happened, so we do have timestamp, we can write. But uh, what happens on the read? The read story is different. Uh, the read, can we do a read on that? Remember, as partition key defines data placement over the cluster, then retrieving data, you need to specify all parts of a partition key. Otherwise, what happens if you don't specify all parts of a partition key? Cassandra simply doesn't know which server to ask, and there can be thousands of them. At first, then, Cassandra may say, I'm not going to execute this query. It's just stupid. I'm not doing that. And as you are the boss, as you are the programmer, you can use some uh, bad words, uh, some rude words, uh, call it a low filtering. Uh, you can force Cassandra to uh, go and uh, make filtering on these uh, data without specifying all the parts of a partition key. And then people, I don't know about you, but when I order pizza, I specify my full address, street, city, street, house number, and uh, then they can reach me. Delivery guy or girl can reach me easily. And making query without specifying all parts of a partition key is as stupid as ordering pizza without giving your house number or room number, apartment number then a delivery person will have to knock every door on the street and ask, have you ordered pizza, man? No? Okay, I will go to next one. And then on the next door, knock again. Have you ordered pizza, sir? No, I will go when. Well, I don't lie. Pizza must be hot, right? So you need to specify the full address. That's exactly the same with a partition key. Can I write this data? Yes. Can I read this data? Then reading this data, I will have to specify both sensor ID, which I know, and timestamp of each record, which I don't. So this partitioning may be questionable for some of your access models on how exactly you are going to work with this data. 
Second part of the uh, primary key is optional. It's called a clustering column. Clustering column is used for two purposes. Ensure uniqueness of the data and establish sorting order if you need that. And that's optional. So first of all, what do I mean for ensure uniqueness? Imagine I have primary key like that, just sensor ID. And that is the temperatures by sensor table with ID, date, timestamp, and value. That will happen then. If I will uh, make a second write for the same sensor after some second sensor being launched, Cassandra uses absurd. So new record will simply overwrite the previous record. Then I will have one record per sensor always as each next record will be rewrite the previous one. I don't know if it's bad. Maybe it's exactly what you need for your, your use case. Uh, but in most of the cases, you want to have the history. So this one will work, uh, but it will be not unique. And uh, maybe you need it uh, to have unique. When we could think about, for example, something like that, sensor and timestamp, uh, which is already much better. So unique on by sensor and then group it by timestamp. Or we could think about sensor and date and timestamp where we have it sorted uh, by date, so we can get easily for one particular date instead of defining ranges. In this case, we still can get data uh, by uh, range, but we will need to specify the full range, which may be not convenient. Here, we can just put the equal date, uh, something, and get our data back. Still fine. Uh, then, uh, finally, primary key consists of a partition key and clustering columns if they are present. It uniquely identifies a row. Like uh, on this example, we discussed all the parts of a primary key. Uh, this is very, 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 very important to understand. Partition keys define data distribution over cluster. Based on the partition key, data will be placed on node A or node B or any another node. Then clustering columns define how data is physically stored, written on disk. What that means for us and why I am saying that is highly important to understand. The long story short, once created, data model cannot be changed. You will need to create new table and migrate the data. Uh, in data in relational databases, you can think so you can do things like uh, change primary key and it will work. In Cassandra, it will not work. Why? Take a look again at this slide. What will happen if we change a partition key? New partition key will mean new token. New token mostly probably will hit different partition. That will mean to the need to change uh, data placement everywhere. Uh, and cluster will be busy transferring data from one node to another, basically all data you have that is as bad as it sounds. So that is not possible. When we have clustering columns, as we decide uh, how data is physically stored, a changing clustering column would lead to rewriting data on disk again, all data you have. And that is again, not really the brightest idea you might ever get. Uh, so uh, alter table exists in Cassandra query language, but uh, it has much less capabilities. Uh, you can change some settings. You can add data columns. Data column is the column what is not mentioned in primary key. So in this case, data column is value. Uh, so you can add or delete data columns, but you cannot change any parts of a primary key. Schema is immutable once created. And data migration is no fun. If you cannot afford downtime, that means what you will need to do double writes to different tables uh, while migrating. So there is no fun at all in this. Now, uh, last thing, last thing of us today. Rules of a good partition. It's very important to keep your partitions over under control and then they will be your friends. That's like with gremlins. Uh, you don't uh, give them food after midnight, uh, you don't let them contact with water, and you will be friends. But if something like that happens, you are in real troubles. So follow these three rules and you will be good. First, store together what you retrieve together. If you are going to uh, like 
YouTube video and we want to show all the comments to this video. It makes sense to partition them by video ID. So I will do uh, need to do one query to one server to get my comments and we are good. I will not have to ask multiple queries for multiple different partitions. Um, so this part must be simple, right? You just don't want to make too small partitions. But avoiding making too small partitions, you have to also avoid big partitions. Um, if you partition, uh, I don't know your particular use case, but uh, comments, there can be really a lot of comments for one video. So, for example, that like they can be really a lot, but good for us, they usually pretty small. I mean, outer name, outer ID, outer name because we use the normalization, uh, comment text, timestamp, comment ID, basically five, six, seven fields, and you are good. And uh, all of them are text, and if there are limitations of amount of a comment, uh, they never will be too big. Uh, but in some scenarios, you do want to avoid big partitions because, for example, if you do partitioning for your user based on countries, and there are some countries like San Marino, like how many people live in San Marino or Vatican, I don't know, uh, very small countries. Uh, and meanwhile, uh, there are uh, China or India, or like huge uh, with uh, hundreds, millions, and there can be plenty of data. So in this case, it's obviously going to be, first of all, big, which is bad. And second of all, it's going to be uneven. Uh, some partitions are small, some partitions are big. It uh, like doesn't help with scaling at all. No fun. So we prefer to keep our partitions of a limited size, and we prefer to have our partitions more or less even. There is uh, recommendations not to have more than 100,000 rows in a partition, or not to have more than 100 megabytes in a partition. Uh, hard limit is up to 2 billion cells per partition. That is a hard limit. You cannot have more. Uh, account of rows, size, uh, those are recommendations. But believe me, uh, those are really recommendations you don't want uh, to break, uh, but you want to follow. A uh, very important thing is uh, also, as uh, Stefana mentioned already, nature of constantly growing partition. Is partition have no limitation on size, uh, on time and only grows over time, it may become too big uh, over time. Like imagine we're writing those temperatures all the time, every 10 seconds. In a few months, they will become too big. Uh, so in this case, we can introduce so-called bucketing. Uh, bucketing means what we will create smaller partitions, so buckets, with the help of an additional value. In this case, you see, in addition to sensor ID as a main part of a partition key, we also introduce it month year. What is a month year? Like today is uh, December of 2022, so it's going to be 2022 12th. What happens then? Uh, new year is happening, and then there is a new month and new year. It's going to be 2023-01. So partition key has changed. So partition token has changed. So we create new partition, and new partition will be put to a new server, or well, next server, most probably not this one. Um, and that is a very important and cool thing. There can be other ideas, like people again say, why not to use timestamp? Why not to use date? Uh, answer is we don't want to have partition too small also, uh, because if you make it too small or a right time, it's all good. Uh, on the read time, Again, you will have to specify uh, all the parts of a partition key. If I'm going to retrieve data for uh, last three months, my query will be select everything where sensor ID equals ABC and month year is in 2022-12, uh, 2022-11, uh, 2022 2022-10. So October, November, December. We are good. It will hit three different servers, mostly probably, because those are three different partitions. So it kind of violates the first rule, store together what you retrieve together, but it's not so bad. It's not 300 partition. But if you bucket your data based on the date, if you're going to retrieve your data uh, for three last months based on the date, you will have to specify all the dates. You will hit 90 partitions. And that's not going to be fun. 
So that's the idea of keeping partitions of a reasonable size. Don't let them grow too much, but don't have also too small. And then finally, avoid hot partition. What is a hot partition? Hot partition is a partition what being accessed all the time while others are idling. Imagine me storing the same temperatures from the same sensors with a partitioning like that. There are some people in the chat like Aaron, mostly probably now having a heart attack. <laughs> the story is, imagine I have very powerful data center of 100 extremely expensive, very cool, uh, very powerful servers. And I have partitioning like that. That means on each date, all the records will go to the same servers, replication factor, let's say three. So three servers are extremely busy and I have uh, all the other servers are idling because they're not responsible for this token range and therefore for this partition. And now I open five more factories or I deploy a dozen of new sensor networks and they start to write. And now my servers are not coping with this pressure. Ah, okay, I'm a rich guy. Uh, there is a big successful company. I have money. I will buy 100 more of those damn expensive, powerful servers. What will happen? Will it help? No, because there still will be free servers responsible for the same partition. Uh, so you see, idea is isolate not only volume, but also velocity. And this case is a perfect scenario for the one partition being super busy while all others are idling. Then scaling doesn't work. I tell you, scale this data model, this Cassandra performance is a shared responsibility, a shared between you and Cassandra. Cassandra gives you tools, but you need to know how to use them. Cassandra is not a bicycle uh, or a scooter you can sit and drive without understanding nothing. Cassandra is more of an Airbus or Boeing. And then you enter the cabin, you have 1,000 of different knobs and levers, and you really need to know how to use it before taking off. Indeed. You don't want your pilot to learn how to land your airplane lie right in the middle of the flight, okay? Um, last questions. Question number eight. So, select without partition key is a syntax error, a key to get all data, very bad, illegal, and punishable by law. As a database police employee uh, officer, I should uh, say what uh, actually answer number four must be the right answer. But sadly, it is not a right answer. Is selective auto partition key is very bad. Technically, it's not a syntax error because syntactically you can do that. Uh, but it is very bad and you have to avoid it at all costs and also stop your uh, well, colleagues if you see it happening. If you see a low filtering in your code, then something must be very, very, very bad. Exceptions are like you can nearly never happen. Good. And then last question. What is the most important rule of the partition in data? Try to have as many partitions as possible. Keep partition size under control. Keep together what you retrieve together. Make partitions bigger. I'm a bit curious of what you will answer. Time is up. And keep together what you retrieve together is the important rule of a partition and data. But the most important rule is to keep partition size under control. I mean, uh, you see the story is uh, if you have inefficient data model that doesn't really answer your query, you always can migrate. Uh, but if you have partitions too big, then basically partition being too big will um, start to interfere with uh, the node performance. Node is not performing, will lead to a performance problem of the whole cluster, and then may potentially lead to much worse problems. So uh, keep together what retrieve together is the right rule. You need to follow it. But keep partition size under control is the most important rule you need to remember today. That brings us to the leaderboard. And I want to name in person people who gave the most right answers. 
uh, nickname Andy, uh, nickname Bell, Nakshatra, and Deepak. And I cannot see our names already because they're hidden behind Andy. Uh, I kindly write, ask you if you are in the chat, in the YouTube chat, please write what place you take in. And that was a very, very, very great job. Uh, what's your nick or what's your place uh, on the leaderboard? And thank you so much. Now, with that said, I'm going to give the oh, um, I K uh, Benignas. I'm sorry, yeah, the possible oh. connection errors. Yeah, that's always it. Just a uh, five fifth place, that's a very good result. Uh, congrats. And I'm switching us to Stefanos. Very nice. We are ready. You are live. Okay, great. Thank you, Alex. So, yeah, um, we have been, well, you've been learning a lot about Cassandra, how it works and how cool it is. And we have created a table, uh, well, actually four tables on, uh, you have created four tables on your own AstraDB instance. Now, the practice goes on and uh, shows you how to do CRUD operations. So CRUD operations are the, the build, basic building blocks of interacting with a database because they mean they stand for create, uh, read, update, and delete. So the, the most important, most basic operations you do with data. You put data, you read data, you change data, and you take out data, basically. So there is a whole, as you see here in the readme, there is a whole uh, set of instructions to try to do or various kinds of uh, CRUD operations. Uh, we are a bit short on time. Actually, we are a bit over time. So I'm, I'm going to improvise with a shorter version here, and then you will mm -hmm. you will probably uh, benefit from looking at all quirks uh, that you see here in the provided commands. But most basically, so uh, where were we? Uh, we were at the SQL console here in the web, uh, in the web browser, and you were on the sensor data um, key space. So if you remember, there were a few tables, one of which is networks. So I'm going to do a desk table networks, just to remind me of its structure. You remember there are three fields, name, description, and region. They are all text. Uh, there is no varchar with a fixed size in Cassandra. There is just text of any size, any reasonable size, and that's uh, auto-sized for you, by the way. And the primary key is name. So, um, in well, this syntax means that it is a, a primary key and it is also the partition key. So, actually, every partition is a single row here, and every value of name will be a single row, a single partition, but that's... Uh, a detail. So let's insert some data. Well, maybe I'll keep this description a little more. How do you insert data? Well, that's something very much uh, SQL looking. And you, what you do is uh, insert into table name. And then you list the fields you want to insert. I'm going to list all of them, name, description, and region. And then values, followed by a similar tuple of Yes, which have to match one by one the column names I put there. So let's say I want to insert a network called my net, which has the description my nice network, and it is in region uh, I don't know lakes, whatever. Okay, so you see, I hit enter, and this is how I insert a row. Uh, how do you know this has been inserted? Well, of course, the right way is to run a select. So select, let's say the simple case, select splat from networks. I'm typing the commands, the keyword uppercase, but that's actually uh, not uh, required. I'm just trying to make that uh, easier for you to read. So if I just run a select splat from networks, do, can you guess what I'm getting? I'm getting my row back. So you see name, my net, description, my nice network, and region lakes. Uh, funnily enough, this is not the very best way to query a table. Actually, in a table with a lot of data, this might not even work at all, because you see, in theory, this query uh, 
needs data from all partitions. Now, this is an easy table. There's one row, so it should work. But in general, on a real table, probably this is just not working or timing out or going very slow. Or it is not the right way to access your data. If you designed a table with name as partition key, usually the only queries that make sense to run are those where you specify specify the value for name. For example, this is a good query. This is a good query because as soon as in my where clause, I specify in this case name, but in general, the full partition key, then the query will have to go to a single source of data, a single partition. Even if my cluster is 1000 nodes, it will be just a matter of one, two nodes, depending on the, on the consistency level of my read. And then I will get my data back. So there is no need to ask around to all the cluster to get pieces of data. So this is the right query. This is the typical right query, the one that specifies the whole partition in a, in a where clause. And then you can invent variations. So you just need the region. Yes, that's something you can do and so on. So this is how you query data. The only reasonable way is querying a single partition. But that does not mean a single row. In this in this table, it, it the, the two are the same, but that's not true in general. OK, so let's see how do you uh, update existing data. Let me try one thing. I'm just trying to change. Oh, I'm just trying to do an insert of a, over an existing row. I'm just doing the same insert with a different description. So I'm writing again my net with a description that is now my lovely network. And this does not give an error. It just succeeds. Well, that's because of how the storage works in Cassandra. Basically, it's a append-only uh, log behind the scenes. Well, it's more, much more, but it's based on append-only structures. So it doesn't have to waste time in checking whatever is there on the, on the, on the database earlier. And that's why this write just succeeds. So this write has no way in general to to know if there was or not an, a pre-existing row with that value for the primary key. Indeed, if I now do my, my read, I, oh, sorry, I have to read, I have to select description in this case, I will get the new way, the new description. The old ones has been overwritten, it's not there anymore. So basically, uh, an update is a write which happens which happens to uh, work on a row that was in the database already. Well, that's not to say you cannot issue a specific command update table net to update works set uh, description equal my new description where name is my net. This is also something that you can do. And it will also result in a new value of the description. But update and insert are 99.9% .9 the same. They are just absurds. They write whatever was there before. So that's an important point to keep in mind. And that's one of the implications of the speed in write speed of Cassandra. So this is so far we have, we have uh, written data, updated data basically, read data. Let's delete data, shall we? So <laughs> that's easy. Delete from networks where name is my net. That's it. So if I now read from the table, rest assured, there is nothing to be found. Now uh, we could we could tell a bit more about how Cassandra works and how to interact with it. So you can have, there are something, there is something called lightweight transaction that is an advanced uh, read and write pattern that allows actually to do some pre-check before actually succeeding with the write. So that's how you can check what is on the database before uh, conditionally doing a change. And that's a mechanism that is there. Um, we can also add that the fact that deletes, you can do a single delete of a single row of a whole partition, you can do a range delete, so and that has implications on, on storage and on, on performance, so you should do the widest 
single delete that you can if you want to get rid of a given chunk of data. But I think it's 25 past, so I will stop with these. So you have seen how to write, uh, read, update, and delete data. Actually, I will stop with boom because I'll do these. Truncate table networks, and that is the widest delete because it wipes out the whole table contents. So don't run this lightheartedly, but I wanted to end on a higher note. Um, yeah, so again, if you look at the readme, there are a few more commands to test and, and writes on various tables. There are different uh, data types to test and to have fun with. So, so this is really just uh, an appetizer, and I hope uh, you are now primed for more Cassandra. And with that, the practice, I think, is over. Right. Back to you, Alex. Thank you so much. And that was great. That's interesting to notice what uh, Cassandra uh, insert, update, and even delete is exactly the same operation technically. Indeed. As we have to be ready to work over petabytes within single digit milliseconds, extremely, quite, extremely quick, we cannot afford doing any changes on disk on any kind of operation, actually, because it's going yeah. changing operation on disk, finding, replacing, updating. It's always very slow. So what actually happens under the hood is append only uh, what's being then merged into a single one piece uh, later in background. Yeah. Cassandra, I can, uh, as a software engineer, I can say what Cassandra is a really piece of programming art. That is a real masterpiece. I am so excited with all the optimizations, uh, tricks uh, in the Cassandra open source uh, code. It's just totally awesome. Okay. Next next year, my one of my uh, yearly goals for next year is going to be to become a Cassandra contributor. So, and I definitely recommend to each developer to work with open source at some point, develop open source. Indeed. So, good. We are done with all the main parts and you have seen the hands-on part. Now you can go and do it on your own now or later, it's fine. Uh, if you want to get this nice page and brag on LinkedIn or Facebook or whatever, you have to complete the hands-on part and uh, uh, submit your homework following the instructions uh, on them, uh, following the instructions on your uh, page uh, on GitHub, you will find it. Uh, important links for you to know. Uh, our Discord server is, uh, you know, the link already was published a couple of times on YouTube chat, uh, dts6.io slash Discord. Then a uh, place to learn its free open source massive online courses, academy.datastacks.com. Now I work to update them because courses are based on Cassandra 3.11 and we are getting uh, already, uh, for, uh, we just got 4.1. So we have to update them for sure. Then uh, for more workshops like this one, uh, you can find them at datastacks.com slash workshops. Find them sign of course uh, and on youtube our handler is data stacks developers so please set the thumbs up like subscribe uh, we are always happy to have new friends uh, me and stefano profiles uh, will publish it on youtube a little bit higher i will do it again if you want to uh, contact us oh, yes. on linkedin we are open for that uh, and um, basically that was it. If you have any questions, uh, we are available right now. We can answer questions right now if you have, or we can contact later on Discord, on LinkedIn, and whatever you prefer. Uh, that was uh, Alex and Stefano, Datastax uh, Developer Advocates. Thank you so much for coming today. You spent, all of you spent so much time with us, but that was not a spent time, that was invested time. And I believe your investment will pay off very well in the end. Stefano? Yes, so thank you all of you for uh, being with us so far. And yes, uh, I reiterate, please join us on Discord where we can continue the discussion and have helping you or anything. <laughs> See you on our next workshop.
Yes, uh, next week we have no workshop, right? It's going to be 28. There we is some, workshop. I think there is something special uh, being uh, uh, boiling in, in the pot by Aaron's, but I'm not ah. sure. But that's not a workshop uh, in the usual sense. Let me yes. check right now. No, 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 we do have. We do uh, have. Uh, Aaron, oh, no, okay. no, I'm sorry. Yes, we do have one live coding, build a simple Java exactly. application and with that's, uh, Astra. That's Aaron. I think. Yes, that's a great idea. So we do have, and then next one already on 4th of January of year 2020. That's going to be very cool. It's how to build a Netflix clone with uh, AstraDB. So with Cassandra behind the scenes and uh, uh, GraphQL API. Right. Plus the, plus the front end. So that's And uh, nice. if you want to learn more about proper data modeling for Cassandra, because data modeling is absolutely essential for Cassandra, as you could have learned it today, should have learned it today, then on 18th of January, we will be special uh, data modeling session, two hours only on how do you model uh, data for Apache Cassandra. Um, I mean, like, yes. there is a free full course you can take at the Academy, but maybe you prefer something shorter. You don't, you are not ready for long-term commitment, but still want to invest some time into that. That totally makes sense. Then 18th, uh, first, 18th of yeah. January is totally for you. Yeah. Thank you so much for coming. Again. Bye. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, I we wish you amazing year holidays amazing holidays yes. and we wish you year 2023 to be best of the best for you merry christmas if you celebrate still have a great vacation and time with your family if you don't and see you next week